Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to our New Creation Fellowship uh, Online Training Center. My name is uh, Roy Williams. I'll be your, instruct your instructor for the next 55 minutes. And uh, as always, uh, I would always like to just ask that you would just get pencil paper so that you can follow along, follow along in Scripture with uh, what you're hearing out of, out of the Word because a lot of times you know you can hear some things that would be uh, truly stated but if it doesn't line up with Scripture it's not a true statement. So hopefully you have your Bible and your uh, pencil and paper. Well anyway you should have because you're students. And uh, we'll just get into the Word of, of Communion. And here again I always like to just illustrate that Communion for me was just something that we did on Sundays or, you know, every other month or quarterly. And I didn't really have an understanding of what all of that meant, you know. But once you get off into the Word and get a biblical understanding about what communion means, it better suits, you know, it better suits who you are as a person in Christ Jesus. So I uh, like to just basically open up, open up and... Uh, a verse of scripture here and that I'm going to go to 1st Corinthians chapter chapter 1 that's 1st Corinthians chapter 1 and we're going to look at uh, no excuse me 1st Corinthians chapter 11 Yeah, I, I wanted to just, just uh, address chapter 1 first too before we get into 11 because this is so very key into us uh, being of, uh, on one accord and uh, it's going to be based on uh, what we speak and who we are in Christ Jesus and, and not any other thing you might hear in the world. So 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 10 and it says, Now I beseech you uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, no, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same things and that there is no division among you. See, there will be division among the body of Christ if they're not speaking the same thing. That's why the word is so very important, you know, and that you, you understand how it all applies to you. But that you are, the, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and also it says, in the same judgments. And in the Amplified Bible, it, it reads, it says, But I urge you and I entreat you, brethren, by the mercies, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be perfect, that you all be in perfect harmony and full agreement in what you say, and that there be no dissension or factions or division among you, but that you be perfectly united in your common understanding, in your opinions, and also in your judgments. And that should all be based, the premises of all what you just heard there should be based on the Word, on the Word of God, which is the foundation that has been laid, as scriptures say, that no other man can lay. And it's just from that foundation you build. But you build on it, not what you own understand it, you build on it what, with the Word of God. Amen. Okay, so I was going to First First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse. Uh, I'm gonna start reading in verse twenty-three, and this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, and it's always important for me to understand. You know, a lot of the things that are are being said are being said from a a, a premise of. Paul get revelation from the Lord. And notice it's not his opinion, it's not his ideals, but it is the very word of God as it had been revealed to him. So that's why he can start off here in verse 23. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was portrayed, he says, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he says, he break it, and he says, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, he says, now do this in remembrance of me, and he says, and after the same manner, he says, he, he also took the cup, and uh, uh, when he had uh, supped, saying, this cup 
is the New Testament or the New Covenant in my blood. He says, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So our partaking of communion should always be with the attitude and in an atmosphere of remembering what God has done. It's because our remembering what he has done gives us all that he has given. We can receive what he has given, receive for uh, what he has done. Because a lot of times, you know, like I said earlier, you know, I just did it because they told me this is what we do, you know, uh, on the four Sundays or every other month or quarterly. And I didn't have an understanding at all what this represents. But everything that we read here, in reference to him taking the bread. See, that represents something because he says it was his body that was broken, broken for us. And then it tells us a little later on in that verse of scripture, in that chapter, he says, by our not discerning the Lord's body or remembering what it has done, it says it brings sickness upon those that partake of it, not having understanding of, uh, not remembering the significance of the, of the broken body or, or the or the bread and that's so that's so very important to understand because a lot of times it's hard for man to receive what he don't understand and see and God doesn't just want us to physically grow up because we're already grown see it's, it's 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 a knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and once you know you're going to speak it see and and that's what a mature Christian would do he, he will speak the things of God because he understands who he is what God has given and uh, all that belongs to him as a king as a priest as an heir and that's who you are in Christ Jesus because a lot of times everything God gave to man he gave to man based on a promise See, that's what all a covenant is. A covenant is a promise. Notice what he says here in verse uh, 25. He says, and after the same manner, he says, he also took um, 1, Corinthians, that chap chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. He says, and in the same manner, he says, he also took the cup. And when he had supped or drank, uh, saying, this cup is the new covenant or the New Testament it says here but a testament is a covenant a covenant is a will and see and a will is activated once somebody dies but guess who died he did and once he died all that was his is yours it's mine see and it's based on watch this it's based on you receiving it's not a work see if you have to work then it's a debt no, but if you receive, it's grace. And see, and that's how we want to receive this from God. See, we don't want to have that works mentality, thinking it's something that we have to do in order to qualify, something we have to do in order to please God. If God wasn't pleased 2,000 years ago, guess what? He will not be pleased. See, so you've got to get out of that works mentality and start receiving God based on how he's given it to you. And he's given it based on grace. And so I was... Uh, studying last night and so I, I went over to uh, Romans chapter 4 and I looked at a couple of scriptures over here that, I, that helped me to understand you know just why it's so important to get out of the works mentality you know because David says blessed is the man I want you to I'll say excuse me chapter Romans chapter 4 and I'm going to start reading. I'm just, I'm just going to get on uh, visit a couple of verses here, but I just want to just, just uh, uh, look at this one here uh, right quick. Verse 8 in chapter 4 of, uh, of Romans. It says, Bless, notice what David says. He says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not. And, and you know, uh, the reason I remember what this means in Greek is because my auntie is named May. And it comes from a Greek word called ome. And it's a double negative. He says he will not, he shall not, he cannot impute sin upon you. Why? Because of Jesus. See, it won't happen. See, because what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. See, you have to remember that. Remember that all sin has been taken away. See, if you still have a sin consciousness, there's a whole lot of things that, that will still be a part of your life as far as sickness goes, as far as poverty goes. But you'll see here that... God is the one that justified. Notice what it says here. He says he justified the ungodly. Those that are ungodly, it says God is the one that justifies them. And once he makes righteous the ungodly, watch this, there's nobody can bring a charge against you. They might bring a charge against you, but it won't stick because of what Jesus did. Now I want, I want you to say, um, 
in verse 5, chapter 4 of Romans, notice what it says. Chapter 4 of Romans, verse 5. Now, watch what it says. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies or make righteous, what? The ungodly. His faith. What? Just based on believing. It says, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. The same faith that Abraham exercised. All Abraham had to do was believe God and it was a credit to him for righteousness. Just believe and that's all it is. See, so you know what I like? It takes the works mentality out of the whole plan of man. See, but you grow up with that mentality. It's something you have to do. Yeah, in the world, that may be so. But you're not in the world. You're in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom, it's already been set. So all you we have to do is receive what God has so graciously given. So when we look in that communion, everything God has given, even your healing, you don't have to work for it. All you have to do is receive it. That's all, that's all you have to do is receive it. See, the reason a lot of people are not receiving it because a lot of the church leaders are telling you it's something you have to do or be in order to receive your healing. No, it's something you receive. And God has set it forth right here. He, said it's not, he says, now to him that worketh, in verse 4 of Romans 4, it says, now to him that worketh is, is the reward not reckoned of grace? No. He says, but debt. See, it, it, it's something that, that's owed for those that, that work, that have that mentality. See, but in verse 3 it says, chapter 4, verse 3 it says, For what says the scriptures? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted, accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, when you go down to verse 7, no, verse 6, it says, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. Watch this, without works. See, it wasn't based on what David did. It wasn't based on what Abraham did. It wasn't based upon what they did, the forefathers did. But it was all based upon what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So we can receive the fullness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the healing that God has provided for us. Because every ill that came into the world with sin, Jesus became 2,000 years ago. So we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so when we look here, we're looking at... Uh, I'm going to go and read verse 6 again. It says, Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose inequities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. He says, Blessed is the man, in verse 8, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It's done. It's been fulfilled. It's been destroyed. And who did it? Christ Jesus. Why? So we wouldn't have to live a sin consciousness. So we wouldn't have to, to have a works mentality. So we can know and understand that Jesus is our qualifier. God is our qualifier. He's the one that qualified us for all of these blessings. And it was all given to us based upon what? A promise. So when we look at what God has done just in the very act of communion. See, it's all based on the promises. The promise, if we will remember what God has done, just remember that his body was broken. Why? That ours would be made whole. But it's something that we have to receive. It's nothing that you work for. See, if you're still locked into that works mentality, you want, you're not in, in the, the area of receiving. See, because a lot of times I just went to church because basically they made me go to church because that's what we did as the Williams family. We went to church on Sunday. And believe me, I went by force. I didn't want to go. They made me. Because like a lot of times what I would see in the household didn't line up what was going on in scripture or in the church. And so, so I, didn't, I didn't have a real feel for the, for the things of God because I didn't understand the very word of God, the very nature of God. And see, men makes it complicated. See, they'll give you that works mentality. They'll tell you it's something that you have to do. There's nothing there's nothing, I said nothing, nothing, nothing you have to do but receive the things of God. Now, I want to read back, I'm back in Romans chapter 4 verse 9. It says, now let me read 8 again. Romans 4 chapter 8. It says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord 
will not. That's a double negative. He says he will not impute sin. See, he doesn't even remember it. He says, for, he says he's going to forget it. That's the only way that he could really love you. <laughs> That's the only way that you can come to the throne of grace with boldness and find help and grace in the time of need because of what God did in Christ Jesus. So it says, in verse 9, it says, Come this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. That's a question. He says, if we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So how was it then reckoned in verse 10? When he was circumcised or when he was uncircumcised? No, it's when he was circumcised. It says, no. In circumcision, but not in uncircumcision. So it's telling us here why Abraham, which was circumcision, was the was not really circumcision was a sign of the covenant. See, but Abraham was uncircumcised when he when he believed God and he became the righteousness of God based on what he became righteous based on what he believed. And see, that's what's so key about it. He believed it. And he became righteous. And Abraham was a servant. He was, an all, he was also a Gentile. See, I, a lot of times I, I didn't know that, you know, uh, about Abraham until I started studying the word of God. He was a Gentile. So a lot of people still think, think that, that he was a Jew. No, the Jewish nation came. They descended from, uh, from the tribe of Judah from, from uh, Abraham. Yeah, and see, and that's, that's why it's so important for you to study. See, so that's why when you look over and you go in the book of Galatians when he says, and the scriptures for Saul, see, and see he, he was speaking based on who Abraham was at that point in time in history. So he was saying, if, uh, I believe that's 329. Yeah, and that's going to be in verse... Verse Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, and it says, And the scriptures, he's talking about the word of God here, for Saul. How can the scriptures see if they're dead, if they're not alive? It says the word of God is alive, it's powerful. So it says the scriptures for, for, for seeing that God would justify and make right the heathen through faith. He says he preached the gospel unto Abraham. Saying, in thee all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, at that point in time, Abraham was a Gentile. Just like you and I. See, a Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew. So he's telling that, he's saying, Abraham, he says, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to take you. And it's going to be through your lineage, through your seed, that I'm going to bring forth Jesus. And it's going to be in that seed that all nations of the earth will be blessed. So you have to remember all that. Everything God did was based on a promise. So he promised a seed. And in that seed, he said, not only will you be blessed, he said, you'll be healed. Not only will you be healed, but you'll be prosperous. And there's nothing that you have to do but receive it. That's all. Just receive it. And of course, when you get it says, it says in chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 29, and it says, And if you be in Christ, and every man that's born again, from my understanding of Scripture, you're in Christ. I, I said that you're in Christ. He says, If any man be in Christ, he says, Then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. See, everything God gave to man is a promise. That's what a covenant is. A covenant is a promise that God has made to each and every one of us. And you know, I, I've been you know studying out that that word covenant, just just covenant within itself. And see, because you know, God says He's a covenant keeping God. Until a thousand generations. So you know what? He didn't leave me out. Nor did he leave you out. God keeps covenant. And see it's not a, con a contract or a covenant that you would cut with a man in the world. Who can easily step right out of that covenant. Right out of that contract. See but God is not like that. No. When God cuts covenant. I say he holds true. He holds true to that covenant. And I had an opportunity to just. You know because just in a. Uh, the English definition of covenant, it, it has a, a tendency to rob the definition that that word means in its original language. See, a lot of times, see, I, I didn't know that until I started looking this stuff up. 
See, because I was thinking that in English, and that's true, a covenant means a, a contract on behalf or a covenant on behalf of two parties. But scripture tells me that God is one. See, it says a mediator involves two, but it says God is one. So when I looked up this word covenant, and, and, and you know, I, I mean, I just rejoiced because I started thinking, you know, why it's so important for you, for me, to get into the word. Because a lot of men may not study to the degree that you study. They might not have the revelation to the degree that God gives you revelation. See, but that doesn't make you a super person. That just makes you a person with revelation that God wants you to share. So <clears throat> when I considered the English word covenant, like it, it's, it's formed from, from two other meanings. It's a coming together and it also describes an undertaking between two or more parties. But in Greek, the word diatheke is not translated as so. It does not in itself contain the idea of joint or, or two people coming together or, or, or joint obligation. It doesn't reflect that. And see, you need to look this stuff up for yourself. How do you know? I, I'm even telling you the truth. See, but you look it up for yourself and it, it's there. But it, but it means rather an obligation or an undertaking by one person. And it all fits in scripture. Because when God cut the covenant with Abraham, you know, like uh, he says, he says, Abraham, so how will I know? He says, I'm going to cut a covenant. He says, as far he says, as far as me, my covenant is with thee. So I'm thinking that he was getting ready to him and Abraham was getting ready to cut and cut, you know, cut covenant and come together in covenant and walk between the pieces of the, the slayed animal. But it didn't happen like that. Once Abraham gathered the pieces or went and gathered the sacrifice, God put Abraham to sleep. And I used to wonder, why would you do that? Tell a man you're going to cut a covenant with him, then you put him to sleep. What sense does that make? That didn't make no sense to me. But as I read on, he, God wanted man to understand this covenant that he was getting ready to cup, did, cut didn't have anything to do with man. But God himself, because you see right here, that even that word, when you even look up the word covenant or berith uh, uh, in Hebrew, it basically means the same thing. You've got to get into this and study this out for yourself. It's a covenant of one. Man does not have anything to do with the covenant that God cut with Abraham. Because he put Abraham to sleep. And once he put Abraham to sleep, it says, God walked between the pieces. Himself. By himself. Totally. Man didn't have anything to do with it. Just like man didn't have anything to do with what happened to Jesus on the cross. They thought, that they, they thought that they had slain Jesus. No. that was Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world, scriptures tell us. He was already prepared to die. Why? Based on what had already been, been predestined by God. See, so when God walked through the pieces, God cut covenant. For mankind. And he did that to let man know. So man can see that man didn't have anything to do as to whether or not this covenant, covenant worked or it didn't work. Because he told Abraham, he says, in, the, or in, this, in, in, in what I'm getting ready to do. But it's going, you know, that, that, that because of that covenant, it's going to be through your lineage. He says, what I'm getting ready to do, men are going to be blessed unto a thousand generations. And that is so, that is so key for me. So, we see that, you know, in, the, in, in English, the word covenant means, you know, a, a, a undertaking by two parties. You know, a coming together of two individuals. doing. But it does not mean that in the, in the Greek word, diatheke. And so, if you want to look that word up, it's spelled D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E. -E. Look it up. Check it out for yourself. It means a party of one. Only. See, but a lot of times, like I said on my last teaching, if I wanted a, a, a definition of a word when I was reading the Bible, I would go grab an English defin a, a dictionary. I mean, it'll give you a definition of what it means in English, but is that what it means in the original language in which it came from? Because a lot of times when I go and I minister to people, I always tell them when God spoke to man in the beginning, he didn't speak to man in English, nor did he speak to him in Dutch. No, he spoke to him in the native language of Hebrew and the Old Testament and Aramaic and Greek. Uh, Aramaic in the New. 
So that's why it's important. You don't have to be a scholar, but a lot of times when you get these definitions, it'll give you a better understanding of what's being said. It'll explode scripture. It explodes chapters and verses and, and things to you because you get a better understanding of what's being said there. So it's just something to look at. So so, so communion is all about it's all about a covenant together it's all about a promise so God has promised to say, do this in remembrance we go back to covenant I mean communion he says do this in remembrance the partaking of the bread <coughs> he says do this in remembrance of what I've done <coughs> when you partake of communion see you don't take communion I'm going to say this until Jesus comes back you say well you didn't say it once I'm going to say it again because I'm talking to me Watch this. I don't take communion to get healed. I take communion because I am healed. God has healed me. And see, like a lot of times, I always say this too, because these are certain things are absolute. That word have is a perfect tense. <clears throat> it's already been done in the past. It's a past completed action. That's what it is. With benefits and rewards from that point all from that point off into eternity but you have to receive that God has healed you God has blessed you God has prospered you and it's all been based on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago and it's prophecy but it's prophecy that has been fulfilled so when I'm partaking of communion I don't do it lightly anymore when I take that bread I see that bread as his broken body <clears throat> that was broken. Why? That I might be made whole. That I might walk in wholeness and fullness. That I might walk in peace. That I might walk in completeness. That I might walk with a sound mind. That's what all that represents right there. That beating that he took. The, 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 the bruising, all of that was for the inequities. He says, he, he says, and he was bruised for our inequities. This God of the Bible was. And all that is represented in that beaten, broken body that was suffered for you and I 2,000 years ago. Why? That we might be whole and complete and sound. Now sometimes you might get one of those sharp pains and poof! And the first thing the enemy wants you to do is to start you starting to be the accusing of, accuser of the brother, accusing yourself. He wants you to start speaking against what's going on in this body. Well first of all this body's not you. It's something that carries the real you. See, the real you is completely, totally immaculate, immaculate, immaculately healed. The real you. See, this body is something that carries you through time. See, and at times, this body can be hit with various things. The enemy is always trying to come at you with something. So you can name it. You name it. And a lot of times, the body just start lining up to receive it. You don't even want to ingest or in plain. Uh, say, I was planning to say anything that's not in union with God's word. You always want to say what God says in every situation. See, because he did it for a purpose. He did it to let you know that all you got to do is speak life to your life. That's all you have to do. It's speak life to your life. Because if it was based on anything other than what God has provided it would be a work. And it's not a work. You saw what I was reading to you over there in uh, the book of Romans chapter 4 when Paul, when Paul was speaking <coughs> and, and <coughs> excuse me, when he was speaking and so I want uh, it's a verse of scripture I want to read. I think it's uh, verse uh, verse 10 No, 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 not verse 10. It's, uh, it's verse, uh, yeah, verse 13. I'm going to read it in the, uh, King James, and I'm going to read it also in the Amplified. So, okay, look up if you don't have an Amplified. Just listen to what it says. It says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they, if, if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. For the promise and, and the promise of no effect because the law worketh wrath he says but 
But where no law is, there's no transgression. See, you can't transgress. That is the Gentile. You can't transgress a law that was never given to you. The law was not given to the Gentiles. It was given to the Jews. That's something to think about. What do you mean? I've been taught that all my life. I, well, I was true, but I found that it was wrong. According to scripture. No. The law was not given to me. It was not given to you if you are a Gentile. That law was given to separate the, 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 uh, the Jewish nation, separate them unto God. Even they couldn't live unto the law. Because the law is God's standard here. And man could not live there. Even though he said, all that you say we will do. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And all the time, prior to the law, God ministered to each and every one of them through grace. Just like he ministers to us today. It's based on what he's given. Not what you have to work for. So, over here it says... I'm going to start reading here again at, uh, I thought that was 10. Let me see. Then he was credited. No. Okay. Oh, yes. Verse 7. It says, Blessed and happy and to be envied are those whose inequities are forgiven and whose sins are covered, covered up and completely, completely buried. So, a lot of times, you know, we go in and we minister at various places and, and a lot of times we'll ask, you know, those that we're ministering to, you know, this question. I always ask this question because to me it's so very important because it, it, it's not that I'm trying to trip anybody up. I want everybody to know what the scriptures say. But we'll ask them this question. How many sins did Jesus die for? And everybody, it, if it's 50 people in that room, I say 45 the 46 of them are raised their hand and say all of them and still you, uh, until you start naming them all what about murder what about suicide oh no he forgot no 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 see either he died for all of them or he didn't die for any of them see you got you have to realize that he didn't leave any out and when he died and, and, and when he died for sin he did it outside of, he did it outside of time and eternity so he could not miss any See, that's how he sees your life. He, he saw you before you was born. He says, why you was just still a substance. He says, he says he knew you. You know, you know what a substance is? It's like you take three or four eggs and you beat them up. That's a substance. What's that? God said he knew you. Did, did you hear what I'm saying? And then he saw you as you were being formed in your mother's womb. And he saw the day that you came into the earth realm. He saw the, your entire life. He saw this. Did you? And, and guess what? And he saw everything you did, you're doing, and you're going to do. And he forgave you. Oh, and he still loves you. Man, that's an awesome God. See, it's the goodness. See, just knowing about how good he is. Just remembering that. It says it leads. It leads. Let me say that again. It leads, man, unto repentance. And that's not, that word repentance is not used to think it means to just say I'm sorry or confess a sin or something. No, it means to change, it leads you unto changing your mind. See, your mind is being changed as the word is going forth. Because I was hearing things I had never heard before. And, and, and my spirit not only just rejoiced, but it would jump and it would explode with excitement because I knew it was the truth. How did I know? I just knew it was. Because it was the very, the very word of God. See, because it's one thing about the, the Holy Spirit. It says it convicts the believer, not of sin, not of judgment. He says, but it convicts the believer of righteousness, of who you are. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, so you won't always remember that what God did, he did. Why? So that we could be made whole. So that we can be complete and of a sound mind. See, because... The peace that God gives is not the peace that we receive from the world. That's, that's not the peace that we receive. No. See, the peace that he was speaking about, see, it's a, a shalom kind of peace. And, and see, and that word shalom, you got to always remember that uh, he was speaking to a Jewish audience. That's what Jesus was min basically ministering to. And so he was speaking to them basically in Aramaic Hebrew. Right there in the New Testament. It's when he says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. 
He said, so the peace that he was speaking about was that shalom kind of peace where there was nothing missing and nothing broken in their life. There was fullness, wholeness, completeness, and soundness. And that included the healing. <clears throat> that included a sound mind. So that, that included all of it. See, if you just look up that word shalom, you know, in its native language, you'll see that it's an explosive word. It's, it's a big word. It's a word with, you know, multiple meanings that all apply to the peace that God said that he's given us. And you know where that peace rests? It's not in the world. He said, that peace I'm going to put on inside of you. Because he said, he, said, he is the prince of peace. And so the prince of peace lives on, on inside of every believer. So you want to you remember that. See, for your mental health, for your, and, and, see, and, and that evolves right on into your physical health. Understanding that you can rest in peace regardless of what's going on in the world. Because remember, you're not in the world. You're in Christ. You're in the kingdom of God where there's no turmoil. So you got to always remember, God has given you a peace. He's given you a quietness of mind so you can rule and you can rest. And you can, hey, and you can rest without all the issues, with all the issues that are going on in the world. Just always remember that. So when we partake of communion, you got to always remember we're doing it in remembrance that you're healed. That's how you want to, you're healed right now. But it hurts. Oh, okay, it's not based on what you feel. That's what you got to get out of your feelings. You got you to get out of them. Does it hurt awfully? Is it bad? Terribly. But that doesn't dictate or determine as whether or not you're healed. You're healed based on what he says in, in uh, Isaiah 53.3. He says, with, with his stripes, we are. I said, right, it's present tense. We are, right now, we are healed. And so he says, and so as often as we partake of communion and so forth, he says he wants us to do that in remembrance of what he has done. And he says, knowing that you will know and you will understand that God has freely given you all things. And it's based on a, it's based on a promise. It's based on a promise that God started in Abraham. You take Abraham out of the equation, you're going to miss uh, the very covenant that God made with mankind. And all a covenant is is a promise that equates or equals out into a will. And that will is activated or was activated when Christ died. So Christ, guess what he did? He not only said, he initiated the will, it was ratified, and he was rose again to carry that will out. For the will, all that God had promised us, it was all based in and upon him. Because you've got to remember, God is one. That covenant or those promises don't have anything to do with what man does, but everything to do with who man receives. See, so all you have to do is receive what God has so graciously given each and every one of us. You know, a lot of times, you know, I, I used to think, I look back and I, and uh and I see how God operated in the beginning when he created everything. You know, I always like to look back there because, see, you know, you got to always remember God called the end. The end. When did he do it? From the beginning. So you go back and you get a look at on how God operated. So when God created man, watch this. He created, did he create an infant? No. He created Adam, a man. And notice what he says to me in, in scripture. He says, I am recreated. Me. I don't care. Somebody might not even receive this, but I'm receiving it. He says, I am recreated in Christ Jesus. So I don't have to grow up. See, my maturity is based on what I speak. See, it's, it's a speaking. So, because, you know, if I have to grow up, that means I have to do something. No, I don't. See, I've already received this fullness. He says, I am complete in him. Why would he say all that if it wasn't true? See, so when I partake of, of uh, communion, like I said, I'm doing it based on what he's promised in my life. And so you know what I found out I have to do? All I need to do is speak it. That's all I have to do is speak it. If I believe it, what the, he says, all I have to do is speak it. The most powerful voice I say this a lot too because this is, this is so key because I, I always thought it was somebody speaking into my life. No, it's not what you speak into my life that makes me who I am. It's who lives in my life that makes me who I am. Did you? I hope you caught that. That was good. I'm telling you. It's, who, it's who's in me. 
And Christ Jesus is in me. And he didn't give me a little bit of him. He didn't give me a part of him. No, he gave all of the, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He lives on the inside of me right now. You too. You just have to understand on how it operates. And speak and start speaking life to your life. That's what, you, that's what you need to do. Because like the man said, he says, you are recreated in Christ Jesus. So if I have to do anything to make any of this stuff work, then it becomes a work. That's why a lot of people miss it. That's why people, a lot of people are not receiving. Because they're trying to work for it. They're trying to, God, what did I have to do to please you? Well, how would you know when he was pleased? As vast as this God is. How do you know when he's had enough? So, okay, you don't have to stop. Okay, uh, Roy, uh, I'm pleased now. No. So that we could all be on the, the same playing field, the, the le that level playing field. He says, what I'm going to do, he says, I'm going to put everything that you need in Christ Jesus. And then I'm going to take Christ and I'm going to put him in you once you receive him. It's just like when I, I uh, always minister just to a lot of people, and, and uh, especially kids, children, I mean, you know, teenagers and uh, children, eight, nine years old. And a lot of times I used to say, Lord, my goodness, you know, I, you'll have them to say Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. And then I start thinking, I see it now. They don't even understand what they just did there. And that used to puzzle me. They don't have to understand it. All they need to do is receive it. And they receive it by quoting it. And I said, but okay, well, Lord, you must have gave them the baby Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. They receive the same Holy Spirit that lives in you right now. They just, just have to come into understanding what all that means. That's all they have to do. And once they do, they can start speaking life to their life. They can start speaking life to situations. And that's what happens. See, once you start receiving communion, see, you start receiving the very things that God has so graciously given each and every one of us. He's already healed you. See, that's why you do it. See, but they've been teaching me all life, take this cracker if you want to be healed. I don't see that in scripture. Drink this if you want to, if, if you, if you want to be healed. No, no, this, he says that cup is a new covenant. It's, it's, it's a new testament in his blood. Well, like I said, that word covenant means something that he did in and of himself. And based on what he did, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, you're reconciled, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, and your sins have been forgiven. Hello? I hope you, I said it's already done. See, and I used to wonder, because this guy, because I was still in a works mentality when I heard this about six, 15 years ago. He used to say, Oh, I'm just a wide receiver. He would say it, and he would laugh. This pastor, that I used to be, he says, I'm a wide receiver. He said, hit me on the one. And I said, what is he talking about? Say, the things of God are all about receiving. He said, you're an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. But what does an heir have to do in order to get all that has been given to him other than receive? That's all you have to do. And once you receive, and once you receive, watch this, it's all yours. Simple. This stuff is so simple. You, and, and that's what puzzles me when I, and, and now, that's why it's hard for me to listen just to anybody minister the word of God. Because a lot of ministries, ministers, ministers from a works mentality is something you've got to do. That's not it. And if you continue to minister law, and you try to co-mingle it with grace, you're going to lose both. Because they don't go together. It's like water and oil. They don't, it's either all or none. Simple. See, so that's why when he says you partake of this, this communion, and it's what we have in common with this, this God of the Bible. In 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Herein is our love made perfect. Well, I know my love is not perfect, but he's trying to, he's getting ready to show me something here. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. He ain't talking about when you die, when things. See, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people speak judgment upon themselves, about what they say to themselves. Anything contrary to the word, you can judge yourself. But watch what it says here. It says, 
because as he is so are we and he says we're just like him right here right now in the world just say as he is Jesus is not working Jesus is resting did you hear that he's seated at the right hand of the father see in the Old Testament in the temple if you look amongst the furnishings that were in the temple in the holy place there was no place to sit for the high priest because his work was never done that was old covenant but under this new living and better way watch this the Bible says Jesus is seated in heavenly places and we're seated with him in heavenly places because we're in Christ Jesus and that's just how it works so you want to remember this you want to remember these things when you're partaking of communion you heal as you sit he says just like he is he could have said just like he was see even just like he was is awesome because when you look back and see how he mastered every situation the things that he had authority over even death he spoke a, he spoke life into a dead man and he called him forth with a word and if, if you understand that just the makeup of, of a tomb how the tombs were built during that day and time see the tomb went in so many feet and then it dropped down into a groove like that right now and when they mummified that person or got that person ready to be put in that tomb they would wrap him in various spices and oils and so and that person would be that stuff would be hard as a rock but guess what God called Lazarus right out of that tomb and he didn't walk out <laughs> he couldn't have walked out he gravitated out and when he came out notice Jesus didn't loose him he told the disciples he says loose him you take all that grave cloth all that worldly thinking all those philosophies all those ideas and opinions all that self righteous loose him and once he's loosed, I guarantee he'll start living for the things of God. And that's what God has did for us today. God has loosed us with an understanding to know that we're healed. We're forgiven. We're set free. We're whole. We're complete. We're sound right now. And see, so communion is all based on, he says, now you always do this. He says, now remember, he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of what I've done. Do this in remembrance. See, for in verse 26, I'm going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. That he died. Not only did he die, hey, but he lives. And in verse 27, he says, whosoever shall eat this bread, you know, the, the one he's talking about, do it in remembrance. Do this in remembrance of what he's done. And drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ not remembering what the body represents not remembering what the blood represents it, it's, it, that's simple and he wants you to remember that just remember that it's done it's completed see all this stems 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23 on into 34 is based in and upon a finished work it's done see everything Jesus says he said it's finished but a lot of men say well yeah it's almost finished <laughs> but it's something you got to do you better get away from him because he's getting ready to put you back in bondage either it's finished or it's not so don't tell me something's finished and it's something I got to don't tell me something is free and then I got to come out of my pocket no well then it's not free or it's not finished if it's something I got to do that's why it says that he's our qualifier and uh I think that's what's that 160 Okay, let me see. In verse, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse um, 12, he says, And the law is not of faith. He says, But the man that does them shall live by them. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. But here again, we were not under the law. He's speaking to the Jewish nations and made a curse. And he, being made a curse for us, it is written that cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, here again, you got to always remember the law did not apply to the Gentile, only the Jew. But 
I want you to know poverty is a curse sickness is a curse and we have been redeemed from that and that's what is represented when we look there in communion see we're not we're not considering the Lord's body. See, you got to consider what that represented for you. And you got to look at it. You got to look at it in detail. That's your Lord. That's your Savior. You have to look at that. And you got to look at the, 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 the new covenant, the New Testament in his blood, what that represents. It represents more than you just drinking that juice and eating that cracker. It represents a total, complete wholeness and completeness and soundness in your life. God loves you as you sit. I don't care if you never ever look his way. Guess what? That doesn't determine as to, what, as to whether or not he loves you. God just loves you. See, he doesn't love you based on what you do because the Bible says God is love. So that means he loves you based on who he is. And you know that helps me a whole lot. It helps me a whole lot just knowing that what he did for me Notice I said for me, I am the very person he loves this moment. I heard a pastor say one time, he says, God loved me so much, I think he got <laughs> my picture in his, his back pocket. <laughs> well, I feel the same way. Because when you get to know this God of the Bible, you know that he completely, he so totally, and he solely loves you. And it's not based on what you do. Because see, he says, my love, he says, my love is made perfect based on him. Not on what I do. And it says perfect love casts out fear and the things that hinder and keep you from receiving the things of God. So you don't want to, and, and if you continue to operate in fear, and if you continue to operate in unbelief, that evil heart of unbelief, not believing what God has, has said in scripture, then you won't receive the fullness of what God has for you. It's not that he's not giving, it's that you don't have the mentality to receive. So communion is all about receiving what has already been graciously and truly done for each and every believer. So, my friend, family, you're healed. And you're healed in your mind. You're healed in your body. You're healed in your intellect. You're healed in your emotions. You're healed in your relationships. I said totally healed. See, it means more than just one thing. And then because of the new covenant, the, the, the new covenant the, the, of, that's shed because of his blood what he's given so forth you're forgiven you're redeemed you're reconciled you're restored all of these things are yours right now as you sit so please receive what God has so graciously given you and until the next time I want you to know that God loves you and we'll be uh, I'll be looking for a uh, a response paper and all the response paper is is what you learn and what you expect to do with what you learn so we love you and may you continue to walk in the blessings of God amen amen, amen.